it, that idea of, you know, clenching your money, you know, under a, a mattress and not doing anything with it. Go talk to someone, figure out who you need to talk to, ask those questions, put it into an, an account that can slowly be growing money. That's something I didn't do. Um, so I would definitely, if I could go back, I'm telling you, go do that. <laughs> I'm Vivian Tu, a.k.a. Your Rich BFF and your favorite Wall Street girly. I'm Brian Walsh, a.k.a. Dr. Money, and I lead financial planning at SoFi. And this is Richer Lives, the show that helps you learn how to use your money to live your best life. We all want more dollar signs on our bank account. But also more fulfillment, satisfaction, and success. So we're here to bring you conversations with inspiring guests. Who've been where you are and are now where you want to be. And we'll provide guidance that aims to get you there step by step. Because everyone deserves the opportunity to live Richer Richer Lives. lives. Brian, why do you think people are so into real estate shows? So am I people? (laughs) (laughs) Kidding, kind of. So I think at the end of the day, they like to see the houses Mm -hmm. and kind of lives that aren't their own. And on top of that, I think the drama of the relationships between the real people that are on those shows. I mean, that's why I love them. That's why I'm so excited to have Chriselle Staus on the show with us today. You might know her from all six seasons of Netflix's Selling Sunset, where she's gone from the new girl to the talk of the office to newly married. All that's to say she has been through some stuff, and I bet she has lots of life lessons to share with all of us. And she seems to be very on top of her finances, so I cannot wait to talk to her. Before we get into talking with Chriselle, though, let's take a moment to have that talk about transparency that we always start each episode with. It's our way of just showing you how clear and honest we want to be at SoFi. On that note, everyone you hear from today has been compensated for their time, including myself and Chriselle. We're what's called a non-client promoter of SoFi Wealth. And I'm a registered representative of SoFi Securities LLC and an investment advisor representative with SoFi Wealth LLC. Basically, in every episode of Richer Lives, it's my job to make sure that nothing said is false or misrepresents the truth around investing and is generally just good information that helps people get their money right. When it comes to buying or selling houses, there's no agent that we'd all like to work with more than Chriselle Staus. You probably know her from the wildly successful Netflix series, Selling Sunset, or if you're a soap stan, you might remember her from Days of Our Lives. Welcome to Richer Lives, Chriselle. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, if you guys are in the market for a house, call me up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Chriselle, we always like to start with an icebreaker. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready, let's do it. Okay, so let's pretend AI takes over the real estate business. Not too far off. <laughs> okay, what are you changing to and why? Well, I have to say, I really like having multiple different streams of income just in case mm-hmm. anything ever falls through. <laughs> yeah. So I have a lot of things that I pursue, whether it's, you know, reality TV or hosting or writing or recently I've really gotten into, you know, fashion and I did a line with that. But I feel like anything that makes you happy, anything that makes you smile is something that can always start off as a hobby. But you never know if you put some time and effort, especially now in the days of, you know, TikTok, things like that, what can end up becoming you know, a fuel for income. So, yeah. I, mean, I mean, perfect example right here. You're yeah, t- yeah. And you're talking to someone who knows. I love you. <laughs> I know, this is how we found each other. <laughs> Viv, what's your favorite part about SoFi? Hands down, without a doubt, at the top of my list is SoFi checking and savings. Not that everything else SoFi offers isn't amazing, but a high yield savings account is the cornerstone of what I believe everyone needs to start getting their money right. You're totally right. If you're not keeping your savings somewhere where your money is making money, then you're missing out. Especially as interest rates rise, the APY on your money in SoFi savings has risen as well. The other really important part of the high yield savings account is making it simple to transfer your money back and forth to your checking account. And with SoFi, there's no limit on transfers between them. You can set up to 20 vaults for all of your savings goals. And of course, all of that is available in the SoFi app 24 seven. The other really cool thing about moving your savings to SoFi is that you can access additional FDIC insurance up to $2 million on deposits available through a seamless network of participating banks. So stop letting your savings sit in a dark corner and give it a moment in the spotlight. Move your money to SoFi Checking and Savings. Plus, get up to $250 when you also set up direct deposit. You can sign up by going to SoFi.com slash Richer Lives. So, Chriselle, you've talked about that when you were younger, living in a trailer park meant you were doing better than usual. And 
Now I want to know, after living all of this life, what does rich mean to you now? Now that you are selling and buying $40 million homes for your clients, like, do you consider yourself rich? Well, I'm still not to the point where I personally would be buying a $40 million house, <laughs> but I do consider myself, you know, um, rich in the way that, yes, like those things that used to be really stressful are not stressful anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't have to think about, you know, coming up with excuses of why I can't do things yeah. because really I'm worried about, you know, why I can't go to that restaurant or looking at a menu and being like, what can I actually order? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, we're splitting everything evenly. Mm -hmm. Just all the things that, you know, you don't want to be very vocal about. Mm -hmm. I not only think of rich being, you know, not having to stress about having my bills paid, but as far as, you know, the people I have around me, you know, and the things that matter. And I feel really rich in that area with, you know, family and friends and, you know, just the um, circle of support that I have. So oh. the fact that I've figured out a way to have all of that, it does make me feel really rich. You know, I think a lot of people gauge rich with, can I say F you money? Um, <laughs> so I don't have that, but I feel like, you know, really rich in far as, like I said, like where I've come from to, to have that peace of mind and be able to give back has really just made me feel like, you know, I did it. Mm -hmm. So on Selling Sunset, it involves real estate. And any times it comes to Barely. buy... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, but that's the premise. So anytime it comes to real estate, emotions get into play and dealing with psychology of buyers and things like that. What are some common like pitfalls or challenges you see either buyers or sellers kind of go through when it comes to that process? I think that I have seen a lot of people get a little wrapped up in the LA market of wanting to show out a little mm. more than, you know, now you have to remember when you buy this house, it's going to come with property taxes every mm -hmm. year. It's going to come with a lot of money to keep it going, whether that's, you know, I don't know, whatever the, the house is. The yes, exactly. Lawn, so many things. So I think that you know, people forget to factor all of that in. I personally try to talk people into, okay, take the number that you feel like you definitely, this is what you were approved for. And I really think you should go under that so that yeah. you still give yourself some leeway. See, mm -hmm. like that's perfect from a financial planner perspective because that's how we always look at it. It's like, whatever you get pre-approved for, like you should never be buying that house because if you are, you're gonna be cash poor. You're not gonna be able to afford mm -hmm. the ongoing maintenance, all that type of stuff. If you're overextending to buy the house, are you gonna actually be happy in that house? Because you wanna end up making it a home. And if you're stressed out all the time, I mean, yeah, the house might be pretty, but is that gonna feel like a home when you have this stress on your family? So I try and remind them, you know, to keep that in balance. I think that's a really good reminder that, you know, you're working with some of these clients that are ultra high net worth, even really, really rich people can sometimes get caught up in keeping up with the Joneses. What would you say is something that like rich people and the average person think differently about money? Well, this is interesting to me because having been raised in an environment where, you know, when you feel like you get money, you put it under, you know, the mattress mm -hmm. or something. And then now living in this world, I had to basically deconstruct everything that I learned about money because I realized you know, if you do that, you're never going to grow money. And I've right. never really even known or heard of the concept of money growing money. That didn't mm -hmm. even make sense to me. So investing was something that was a completely new idea. It felt very scary to me. So I think that, you know, when people are raised in an environment where they had money growing up, these are things that they were taught. Well, this isn't really taught in our yeah. schooling system. It certainly wasn't when no. I went to school. And so it's just something that I had to kind of learn the hard way. And I think that is the biggest difference, you know, where, you know, I don't think that when you, we grow up poor, you don't know where your food's coming from. You're not thinking about investing. Yeah, totally. And what would you say is like one behavior that no matter how rich someone is or no matter how broke somebody is, like that is a commonality you see across everybody? To be honest with you, money can't buy happiness. I know we all say that. And it, when you really grow up without it, you think, yeah, it can. <laughs> um, to be honest, there are a lot of stressful things that are a lot less stressful. I do work with very high wealth individuals and some of them, you know, aren't the happiest people that you would just assume. So the grass is not always greener. You have to keep that focus on knowing, you know, the people that are gonna be around you when the champagne isn't popping and mm -hmm. you're not on the top of the world, who make sure your friends are still the friends that are gonna be, you know, 
two of my best friends in the whole world are the ones that let me crash on their couch and call it. <laughs> You know, so they don't care, you know, if tomorrow all of this went, you know, down the drain. I think that that is the, the commonality in that money do, does not buy those types of things. Yeah. I think we, we come across a lot of people who, you know, similar to what you said, didn't learn about money growing up, whether it be in school, from their families, different things like that. As someone who started there and then now has a firm grasp of things, what piece of advice would you give to people to kind of start that journey of learning about money and taking those first steps? Well, uh, follow you, first of all, because you give <laughs> really great advice. I think that this show is a great, you know, platform for that. I think that this whole world of social media is really helpful for people because... You guys, I didn't pay her to say it, but <laughs> I just want to be really no. clear. <laughs> no, but it's it's interesting how, you know, you can get this you know, intellectual information now so easily that, you know, really was not easily accessible before. So I think yeah. that that's amazing. And I also think that, like I said, like you don't have to have gotten that dream job to start thinking about investing. You can start investing and do it by percentages. Whatever you're making right now, find out what your expenditures are and find out what percentage you can put away each month, no matter yeah. what the job is, so that you can just slowly grow mm -hmm. that and invest that. Yeah, and I think one of the things you hit on was so powerful with social media, because like with financial education, everyone kind of thinks like, oh, if we just taught all the kids in high school, all the basics of personal finance, they'd be good to go. But so many people forget what they learn with finances if they don't use it. So I think that's why like social media content like this can be powerful because you're thinking about buying a house. Cool, let me tune into this episode. You apply it right away. So I, I think that's just an interesting way for people to learn about personal finances that I guess is different now than ever before. It's so refreshing to hear from someone who has seen so much success that like it's still intimidating for you yeah. because you say like some people might know exactly what they're doing. There are far more people who don't and they think everyone else does. And then they're too afraid to ask for help because we don't talk about how we don't teach this in school. So yeah. I love that you said that. Yeah, because there is a fair amount of overconfidence where like people who think they know what they don't know, then they start making mistakes left and right versus being, I guess, vulnerable and honest enough to say, OK, let me ask questions. Let me look at information. And especially even with housing, you know, there are multiple different types of loans, you know, just because you can get a house, you have to know what that loan is. This could be mm -hmm. a really terrible loan. And mm -hmm. you're, you know, 10 years down the road, you realize you barely put any money into your home. I think that we're used to, you know, just letting someone else do it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you're gonna do better if you get in there, ask those questions and, you know, how much, okay, ask, no question is stupid. I used to do this. Oh, they know better than me, I'll just defer to them. You know, I think that it really is, I, I got lucky and I had somebody that really kind of took me under their wing and helped me through that process. Mm -hmm. Um, and so not everybody has that. So I do, I do think that it's important to, you know, make sure you get the right loans, make sure you're asking the right questions. I'm kind of a research nerd. So with financial education, there's something called the decay effect. And essentially it's like, if you don't use it, you lose it. Mm. And for some reason with financial information, it's way more than anything else. So it's kind of one of those things where it's like just in time content where you're gonna buy a house, cool, let's watch some videos. Or you need to invest, great, let's watch some videos. Like that is way more powerful than saying, okay, I'm gonna open up a personal finance textbook, read everything and think you're gonna remember it for the rest of your life. I'd love to take a second to pivot. Um, so I'm getting married next year. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm very excited. Wedding planning's a nightmare. But <laughs> um, just to in Vegas, it's way yeah. easier. <laughs> I'd love to know that when you and G decided to combine your lives, when did you have the conversation of, hey, should we get joint bank accounts? Like, you know, how are we going to make two lives into one? Personally, I think that you should always keep some independence mm -hmm. in a relationship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you never know what's going to happen. So as someone that speaks from experience, I say always keep some independence. But when it comes to, you know, down the line and, you know, raising children, that kind of a thing, I'm sure that conversation will change when there's certain things where, you know, so it, it depends on where you are. Right now, we're very independent. Um, but obviously, I do think that that would change and have, you know, a family account when it comes to, you know, raising kids, which I think would be the reason that, yeah. you know, you would want to have that together. Yeah, daycare is expensive. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. You know, I mean, it's kind of funny because my wife and I would take the complete opposite approach. Everything's combined. But there's, like you said, there's no right or wrong answer here. Like, yeah. 
my approach makes sense for my relationship, yours for yours. Exactly. So another area that we see come up is, let's say, for example, you know, in, in your relationship, there's going to be inconsistent income from time to time. Just it's the nature of things. How do you go about smoothing things out, kind of planning out your finances, knowing that there's going to be great times, there's going to be not great times, and kind of smoothing out the ebbs and flows? Well, I've never been one to spend it as it comes in. I mean, I've been one that's like, oh my God, I got a job. Like, I don't know how long this job will take me because I started in soaps. And, you know, you can be written off at any time. But I save as if this job could be the last. Yeah. And I'm sure that was helpful with your real estate career because that income is not consistent. But when it comes, when it rains, it pours, it's chunky. Every single job I've ever had has been very inconsistent income, especially in luxury real estate, because, you know, you could look at your, you know, portfolio and be like, oh, you only sold two houses in that year. Where it's like, well, one was a $10 million house (laughs) and it took me forever. Like it was so much work. But then when you finally, you know, and you're investing in the marketing and all that stuff, you finally make that check. Yeah, you can't go out and just blow it. Mm -hmm. Um, That could be, you know, your last sale. So there's certain things I feel really, you know, it's luxury to splurge on and I see the value in doing that. Um, But that being said, there's other things I'll be super cheap on where people are like, why are are you doing this? You know, like, you know, certain like domestic flights or something where I'm like, it's two hours. I'm sitting, uh, there's a middle seat. I'm taking it. It's like $2,000 more to sit in the front. Like I'm going to sit here for, you know, two hours of your time, Mm $2,000. I can't, I can't wrap my brain around the value of that. Mm -hmm. So we kind of talked about before with like splitting things up and everything in your relationship. Another kind of common starting point we talk about with couples is aligning on shared goals because like kind of like the goals are what drive everything. So I'd love to hear how like you and G talked about like shared goals, figuring out those types of things and I guess like prioritizing them. I think it's one of those things, you know, we're just very open and transparent about everything. And one of those being, you know, um, we're trying to combine our lives and talk about family planning. And that is something that, you know, is a shared goal of ours. And, um, you know, because we are a same sex couple, um, I feel like it's one of those things where, you know, there's a lot more planning involved where, you know, it's just, you know, and that's a financial, you know, decision. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's one of those things that um, I'm excited about. It's a, a, it's a luxury that I feel really lucky to be able to do. Um, But I do think that, you know, that that's something a lot of people go through. Mm -hmm. It's not cheap to, Mm -hmm. you know, whether you're in a same sex relationship or whether you are, you know, in a relationship where you're, you know, you're not able to get pregnant naturally. There are alternatives, but they're pricey. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, one of our shared goals is just, you know, um, working that out and, you know, trying to figure out how we get our lives to combine because G has, you know, even now they have a studio in LA but it's not like I have a space in my house for a big studio, so we're trying, we're trying to figure all this out. Yeah. Throughout all your responses, it's centered around, like, communication. And I think, like, if I could just take that and, like, pass it on to any person we talk to from a financial planning perspective, I would, because we always hear, like, money is the top cause of divorce, mm-hmm. all these other things. That's because money arguments, they linger, they're severe, and they just kind of never end, and they sit there. The only way to go over that is communication. Yeah. So like the same thing you're talking about is exactly how people should be approaching money in a relationship. Yeah, I think that you should have those conversations even yeah. if they're uncomfortable. I also think that having those conversations with a partner that is the perfect fit for you, you're, you just look so happy. Like yeah. you're yeah. happy even if it's something that could have a little bit of adversity to get through, like you're doing it together, you're a team. Yeah. You can have these conversations, but yeah, if you're in a bad relationship, (laughs) you got to watch a different channel. (laughs) Brian, what are the three things we always talk about on the show? Meeting with a financial planner, Mm -hmm. a high yield savings account, Mm -hmm. and having all your finances all in one place. Nailed it. Which is why I want to talk to all of our viewers about the one thing that we haven't discussed yet, and it seems very fitting with today's guest, home loans. SoFi does offer home mortgage loans, which is just one more way that SoFi helps you have all your money in one place. SoFi has an on-time closed guarantee offer, low down payment options, and flexible loan options. And if you set up SoFi Insights, you can include the value of your home in your overall financial snapshot so you know how much you have left to pay on your mortgage and how much your house may be worth. Next time you're in the market for a home, check out SoFi Home Loans. It might be exactly what you're looking for. Find out more at SoFi.com slash home loans. 
We're back with Chriselle Staus exploring her rich life. We've gone deep into her come up as a top real estate agent and reality star. Now let's lighten things up with a quick game of let's G flip this house. That's right. Sometimes partners are the hardest to please. So let's pretend you and G buy a house together. What are the top three home improvements you're doing? Okay, this is easy for me. Um, we both, you know, I think we would love, you know, our own closets. Mm -hmm. um, when I renovated my home, I did it, you know, for myself living there. And I yeah. just made myself an amazing closet, but with absolutely zero thought of anything. <laughs> <laughs> so these are conversations yeah. that we have. Um, so yeah, two separate closets and then come on anyone that's been in a relationship can understand the value of having separate bathrooms <laughs> I or at least a double vanity double yeah. vanity is the most yeah. yeah yeah um yes so i i would say you know those are luxuries that are you know if you can do it i think yeah. it'd be amazing improvements as far as you know a soundproof room mine are probably different than other people's you know g plays drums <laughs> It's not the most neighbor friendly thing, <laughs> um, you know, so, but then that'd be perfect. We could use the drum room, you know, at night, the baby's crying, you shut yourself in a soundproof room, <laughs> the other person can sleep. It has many uses, so. Chriselle's really trying to avoid any HOA fees. Yes. Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, what about if you can pick three improvements for you, you can pick three improvements for G, now what's on your list? Um, okay, dream home, um, because I made my closet so amazing. I still want my closet. Yeah. So closet, closet. Okay. Okay. Neither one of us cook. So I think a lot of people would say kitchen. We don't care about the kitchen. We don't even use it. <laughs> um, uh, studio for G. Okay. Um, for me, I would say um, I have a spray tan booth. <laughs> <gasps> That's genius. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so... Um, you know what? It's safer than going outside, sitting under the UV yes. rays. It's good for you. And I did a collab, so I didn't even pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I'm still cheap with a lot of things. You are very frugal. I love yeah. that about yes. you. Uh, what else? Okay, two more. I get two more. Um, uh, I think G would like like a garage. They're into cars, okay. and I don't really care about cars. Um, and then for me, last one, what's something I'd really love? Just something silly. Oh, uh, at one of those rooms with like a hidden door and you'd like oh. take a slide <laughs> and it's like something fun down there, like some kind of entertainment space, something with like mm -hmm. a fun wow factor. I mean, okay. a hidden room would be amazing. Yes, yeah, yeah. so you like Behind move like a, a bookcase, candlestick yeah. or something. Okay, yeah. is, am I the only one who has watched too many scary movies and I love the for like the horror movies where like they have a hidden bookcase and that's like their panic room where they can like see like the intro Oh, that's good too. Or okay. is that like crazy? No, but that's good. So it could be an entertaining space, but it, it could double as a panic room. Yeah. Okay. Per now, I mean, from a professional perspective, does that add or decrease <laughs> from home values? Oh, panic rooms <laughs> increase. Okay. <laughs> yes. Panic rooms are very popular actually on the market. Okay. Really? Yes. They, you can definitely. Um, okay. So it's not just value. me who's like a little no. like crazy about that. Okay. No, I think people really love when they, when that's already built and done, people yeah. love that. Okay, cool. so you gotta take the slide into the panic into room. The panic. <laughs> quickly, quickly. Mine would be the only one that is a slide into the panic room. I haven't seen that yet, but <laughs> could be fun. Yeah, good. So you mentioned that you are cheap, which same. What are some of your most toxic cheapskate habits and what are some of your best? Okay, well, I'm actually gonna take the word toxic literal here because, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> I, this is silly, but you know those eye makeup remover pads? Yeah. And I feel like sometimes, you know, I'll use it and I'll barely just need to clean up under my eye, but like, Chrishell. it's just one little piece. I'm like, I didn't even use the other half of it. I should cut it and then yeah. put the yeah. other piece in. Sometimes I'm in a hurry and I don't. I know I shouldn't do that. Okay. <laughs> I need to put a little pair of scissors next to it, but this is, these are the things I, I don't know. I don't like to wait. I don't like to waste food. Mm -hmm. So... I've also been known to, after you go to a restaurant yeah. and then you friends decide you you want to go somewhere after, I've got uh. the doggy bag. <laughs> You're like at the club with the doggy bag. <laughs> I have done that once or twice. Um, <laughs> I mean, it could come in handy later in the evening yeah, though. Yeah, but that is the thing. Yeah. I get made fun of, but then who is happy the next day yep. when they have the leftovers yep. and maybe you had a couple drinks the night before, I'm yeah. just saying. So, yeah. Um, those are maybe toxic slash silly, <laughs> one toxic, one silly. Um, and then the ones that have paid off, I think, like I said, like who remembers a flight you took three years ago, Right. Yeah. but guess 
you know, have the, you know, that adds up in your bank account if you're not splurging every single time. I like that you say, you know, take the budget flight for the two hour flight. That way, when you go to Japan, you can lay flat, have a drink, exactly. enjoy yourself. Exactly. That, that is really, you know, yeah. And it's kind of funny because like people look at budgeting or like saving money, like it's a dirty word, mm -hmm. but it's kind of like the discipline you put in place. So that way you have the freedom to enjoy yourself where it matters. So, I mean, how do you kind of prioritize and pick and choose where you splurge versus where you cut back? I think it's really important for people to, you know, have a tally of what are your expenses every month? Like what, yeah. what is the amount of money that you really need to get by? Not want, but need. And then when you go from there, you know, where, where's the cushion fall? As far as myself, you know, I do prioritize experiences over material things. It's very millennial of us. Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, truly, I, I don't know what I'm wearing right now, but these are, you know, a hundred dollar shoes. i I've tried buying expensive shoes and they hurt my feet and I can't walk in them. And yeah. I think it's like, you know, a status thing. I'm not saying I don't have some, but I end up, you know, I just feel like, I don't know, I don't have, you know, those certain things that call people that I just feel like, you know, a luggage, for instance, you can yeah. go spend over a thousand dollars on a piece of luggage what? is going to get beat to hell. Beat up. Okay, so going back to real estate, we talked about how panic rooms could be worth it. We talked about what you know would be worth it to you and G. What are some things that aren't worth it as far as people making upgrades in their houses? I would say some updates that I've seen that I, I have to be brutally honest with my clients. I know you spent a million dollars <laughs> on this state-of-the-art sound system and these Speakers were flown in from Germany and handmade, but no one cares. Like anything that's super specific to your taste, a lot of times doesn't equate to value in a home. Okay, going off of that, I do have a yeah. spicy item. I feel like this is like hotly debated. Pools Ooh. add or detract value because I feel like they were always a value add yeah. until kind of recently when people were like, oh, we don't want pools. It's like a safety hazard. Pools, I feel like, can go either way. Of course, a lot of times in LA, it's a lot nicer to have one. Yeah. It's easier for me to sell if it does. Um, but depending on, you know, the cost, I feel like, per, as a real estate agent, am, am I going to rather sell a house with one? Yes. <laughs> I also just want to say, as a real estate agent, if you're planning on moving and selling your home, a lot of times people are like, oh, well, let's put a pool in because it will add value. Wow. I think the... The better thing to do is, you know, obviously for the realtor, when they're showing people the property, a pool can be added in and they are willing to do it if, you know, so that way when you find the right buyer, if it's something that they want, you can work it into your contract. Mm. And then you can also, they can put in their input. I just think it's smarter than just like throwing it in yeah, when yeah. you're already moving out as, a, you know, because it's a little shaky whether or not, you know, the family that wants to buy it actually has small children yeah. and the pool is more of a, a safety hazard for them. And you've had such, you know, a successful career. You have all of these highlights. What's some advice that you would give to 18 or 21 year old Chriselle? So many things. How much time do we have? <laughs> oh my God. Um, okay. Um, okay. Specifically about money and investing, let's narrow it down. Um, I would say, you know, again, it, that idea of, you know, clinching your money, you know, under a, a mattress type of thing, even if it is in a, a, you know, a banking account and not doing anything with it. Um, Go talk to someone, figure out who you need to talk to, ask those questions, put it into an, an account that can slowly be growing money. That's something I didn't do. Um, so I would definitely, if I could go back, I'm telling you, go do that. Um, and also, you know, um, find the people that you trust to guide you in the right way. Someone that isn't financially, you know, they're not going to make a lot of money by pushing you into a di direction. That's especially important in finance and why we recommend so many people check out the financial planners at SoFi who are fiduciaries. Exactly. That's everything. And I think yeah. you, you said the word, the key word fiduciary is, mm -hmm. you know, I really think that that's so important. I think that it's not something that's really openly known. Yeah. And I think that, you know, yeah, just kind of letting that be open and, you know, taking the veil off of that and making sure that people understand that is important. Because I yeah. think a lot of people get 
unfortunately, they learn the hard way. Yeah. Chriselle, you talk a lot about living below your means because so much of your income was commission based or very chunky and could be very successful or, you know, very dry at times. What advice would you give to other people who work in industries where they do get inconsistent pay to really bridge those gaps and make sure that they are consistently financially comfortable? I think that it's one of those things that, you know, making sure that, you know, you're not living above your means Mm -hmm. and really knowing what your costs are, but then also, you know, trying to forecast. I, I know it's hard, but it's one of those things where, you know, I feel like you have to know what your leeway is, mm-hmm. you know, how much, how many months do you have? How many years yeah. do you have? You know, that kind of a thing, because knowledge is everything. You know, I feel like, um, the more that you're just kind of like, not really sure that's a, you know, could be disastrous. Very well said. I mean, it's, it's kind of funny as you're saying this, I, I don't have the same inconsistencies with income, but inside of my SoFi checking and savings account, I have different vaults set up for like different purposes and I name them with how much money they should have in there. So as it starts getting lower, I can kind of see like, okay, shoot, I'm about to cross over and I need to save more money. So like even little tricks like that can just make it so much easier. Yeah. And I think also, you know, we're in a world now where there's so much technology that can be helpful as well. Yeah. Because so many people beat up on technology when it comes to money because yeah, it does make it easier to spend money, whether it be like one click purchases or social media, but it can also manage your finances. Like you're speaking my language here because I did my dissertation (laughs) on digital money management technology, but like it is just as impactful as financial literacy when it comes to like spending, borrowing, investing behavior and it's a lot easier than learning about personal finances. Yeah. And if it's easy, if it's digitized, you'll actually do it. Like the SoFi app, I feel like, you know, people have such access now to this technology that is so useful to help you track things like your spending that, you know, why not take advantage of it? You know, I wish I had this before. It would have, yeah. it would have helped me a lot. <laughs> I mean, not just, you know, keeping up with you know, your own spending, but especially, you know, in home buying, your credit score is very Mm -hmm. important about which loan you'll get. If you're going to be buying a home in the next six months, here's your credit score. In those six months, that is the time to work on getting it up. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, what are the things that are dinging it? What could you fix it? And I've seen people bring their credit score up in six months pretty drastically, and it's really helped us get them a better loan. Yeah, it really is just kind of like the awareness of like, okay, what's my score? And then understand, okay, what is the thing I should focus on, right? Like, because everyone's gonna have one thing that either is helping or hurting their score. And if you just focus on that one area, you can you can make some changes. And I think that's the one mistake people make. They normally don't look at their credit score until they are actually yeah. applying to get the loan. And, you know, that's what I, I do love about, you know, this app and that it lets you know and you're always in the know because a lot of times there's nothing you can do now. If you want this house, you gotta, we have to put in the offer today kind of thing. Um, And so the things that you could have helped your credit score on, you kind of needed to know a few months back, you know? So these are things that, these are helpful things that I deal with all the time. I actually love working with first time buyers and I've had a lot of friends and family that I've worked with that, you know, they don't know what they're doing and I'm trying to help them. And I've had to unfortunately tell them, you know, I know you really want this house, but I'm telling you, if you (laughs) clean up this credit score and you try again a little later, it's going to be better. Yeah. And I think this all kind of ties together, right? When we were chatting about communication, you have to communicate with your own finances too. And it's not something that you can just set and forget and never look at again. Like you should check in, especially during big life milestones. Like you know, having a long-term life partner or kids or moving to a different country or anything like that. But it's important to just constantly be making sure that you are on track to live your happily ever after. Absolutely. And I feel like you can always find money too, if you're being smart mm-hmm. about it. What are those subscriptions you didn't, oh. you didn't remember to cancel? Yeah. What are those, you know, why are you paying for storage? You either sell it or <laughs> get rid of it, you know, like things like that. I just feel like there's always, you know, ways to, if you're really paying attention to where you are spending money because you want to save more or you want to be able to have a bigger cushion, what are some things you can, you know, be smarter about. Definitely. Chriselle, thank you so much for coming. This was such a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for chatting with us. Thank you guys. This was so much fun. Our thanks to Chriselle for giving us all the real estate tips and tricks today. So much good advice. If you like this episode of Richer Lives, then be sure to hit the subscribe button so you'll get a reminder to tune in next time. 
it's gonna be more amazing insight into how to live a richer life. Also, drop a comment letting us know who you'd like to see us interview next. You can also find SoFi on TikTok, Instagram, X, and now on Threads too. And of course, on your phone right here. Maybe I need to get my fiance to go to one of these financial planning meetings before we tie the knot. I already got him to sign the prenup though. Highly recommend. Anyway, Brian, can you remind people where we go to make an appointment with a financial planner? Yes, SoFi members can sign up for complimentary financial planning sessions at sofi.com slash no cost financial planning. That's it for this episode. See you next time. Hi again, it's me, Brian Walsh, AKA Dr. Money, here to talk about some legal stuff. Though I am a certified financial planner certificate, your finances are unique. That means anything I talked about today shouldn't be considered advice. Think about it more as high level education or guidance. Also, please subscribe to our channel. You gotta watch a different channel. <laughs> go, go, go get it. Well, anyways, we won't say that. <laughs> Maybe I need to get my fight. Fi- Sorry. So it's really about.